Um, and so before uh, we start, um, uh, I would like to mention um, Brian has been co-advised by Stacy and myself. And uh, Stacy will come up and introduce uh, Brian. But one thing I wanted to make sure to tell everyone that it has been a great pleasure actually working with him. He has been one of the person, individuals that actually reach out to everyone, try to help. So it has been really uh, one of the greatest experience for us as, as supervisors, advisors, you name it, mentor. So thank you, Brian, for all your contributions that I wanted to say. And thank you. Well, I'll just say a little bit about Brian's background. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm the um, LMR CSE PI for Delaware State University. Um, and so um, Brian came, he's been funded by the LMR CSE for the last two, two years. years. He came in um, January of 2017. Um, he got his BS degree from um, Humboldt State University in marine fisheries biology. He did a semester in Hawaii, long he was there. He's originally from Long Beach, California, so he's long way from home. Um, and he is just, if anybody didn't know, this point is a first generation US born citizen of Cuban parents. Um, and he's a middle child. <laughs> <laughs> so that explains that he has to get everything perfect. <laughs> He was the secretary of the Graduate Student Association. Um, he did nurture training under the LMR CSC with um, Howard. Um, I want to thank everybody else who's on the Nons Committee. He organized the LMR CSC webinar. He assisted the University of Delaware people in soil science field collection. He's boat captain. He helped uh, fix the boat trailer. Um, he assisted in uh, Delaware take your kid fishing. He's a volunteer for that. Is, um, well, and he presented his research at a few different conferences, just most recently in Puerto Rico at the ASO conference and at the American Fisheries Society conference in Atlantic City. But as Goldie was saying, yeah, Brian's been a great student to work with. Whenever I asked him to do something, I, mean, I actually wrote a small grant um, with Jessica Miller, and Brian was initially funded under that, and he just took what we, the initial ideas and just ran with it on his own. So he just developed the project by himself um, and reached out to a lot of people, um, New Jersey, Delaware, fisheries people. Great guy, nice person, and um, I can't say enough good things about Brian, so if you want to hire him, let's <laughs> <laughs> do so. <laughs> with that, I'll give you Brian with his terrific ecology of juvenile. Um, thank you, Stacy and Dr. Osbe, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I'll just get right to it. So I got to talk about, I know you guys have things to do. So the title of my thesis work is the Trophic Ecology of Juvenile Weak Fish, Cyanocene Regalis in the Delaware Bay, using stable isotope and stomach content analysis. But before I start talking about the Delaware Bay, got an image here of what a lot of people probably know is what it is. This is the Chesapeake Bay. It's got extremely good name recognition, and also even the shape of the bay is extremely recognizable. It's world famous. NOAA considers it to be one of the most productive bodies of water in the world. And it's also the largest estuary in the United States. But what a lot of people don't know is that its neighbor to the northeast is the lesser known Delaware Bay. And I didn't really know what the Delaware Bay was before I came here, but I don't think that it gets the credit that it really deserves. The Delaware Bay is the third largest estuary in the U.S. It's the second busiest waterway in the U.S. behind the Mississippi River, so it's extremely economically important to the U.S. And in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it supported extremely valuable and productive fisheries, such as the Oyster fishery, have the horseshoe crab fishery, the Atlantic sturgeon fishery, and of course, the tasty and valuable wheat fish. 
And this is Bowers Beach if you, uh, for you locals over here. So what are weak fish? And that's the exact question that I asked when I was answering the job ad to, to Stacy. Uh, but weak fish here are these beautiful specimens. They are from the family Cyanidae. They're in the, the drum family. Their genus and species name is Cyanosine regalis. They're considered to be a marine transient or estuary dependent species. So they make it from offshore wintering grounds in the, in the they make it to Bay Sanction Estuary from offshore wintering grounds in the spring. And so the Delaware Bay is one of those primary spawning and nursery habitats. So what happens here affects the population. So why am I studying beak fish? Uh, they're considered to be a historically important fishery. They've been fished since at least the 1800s, and so we want to see these guys stick around in the long run. But more recently, they supported a major recreational and commercial fishery in the 1980s and 1990s. In 1981, their commercial landings peaked at 16,000 metric tons, valued at over $9 million. And the fishery was so popular that in 1981, the state of Delaware named it their state fish. So, you know, this fish is special to Delawareans. And you can see that the fishery crashed shortly thereafter due to overfishing, it stabilized a bit through throughout the 80s, and then crashed again in the early 90s. In 1995, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, who manages the weak fish population in the fishery, they finally put mandatory catch limits, and it was thought that the fishery was beginning to rebound. You can see this slight uptick. But then the fishery crashed again, and now it's less than 1% of what it used to be. So why did this happen? What happened? Um, I think that because mandatory catch limits weren't uh, imposed until 95, you know, this is 15 years after that initial um, crash, and so we could have probably done something better before that happened. Um, but more recently, the fishery isn't rebounding, not because fishing mortality is to blame, but because natural mortality is so high. At it's really at unprecedented rates. And fishery managers are really scratching their heads as to why natural mortality is so high. We still don't really have a, a good understanding of what's going on. And you can see that in starting in 2000, natural mortality in the green started in, increasing to these really increased rates and they're still high today. Whereas fishing mortality in the blue here is really low, so really not contributing to the total mortality of this fish. So overall, we have a great weak fish fishery in the 80s and 90s. Like people were catching fish this big, they were loading up their 50 gallon coolers full of these things in one day. And then when those are full, they start loading up their 20 gallon trash bags full of these things. And everybody and their brother was doing this on the bay, you know, for years. And of course this is unsustainable. And you know, it was amazing, but alas, unsustainable. And now we're left with a lot of these dinky little guys. Not a lot of age four weak fish coming back in the trough surface, but nothing much older than that. Um, this is, you know, what I'm used to as a fisherman, and I'm not a very good fisherman, but I want to be able to catch those big weak fish. Um, this is why I got into fisheries in the first place. So, what do we know about the weak fish problem and this natural mortality problem? There's been a lot of investigations as to why this is happening. So, in the 2009 stock assessment, fishery managers noted that there was a diet shift from forage fish and large invertebrates to simply small invertebrates. Things like E. triloba, these isopod species, even this invasive Asian isopod that's recently made it to the Delaware Bay. Polychaete worms, crank on spinosa, or sand shrimp. And these, by the way, are all the things that I've been noticing in the weak fish stomachs during the course of my study. This guy here, a gamma pod species named C. tubularis, that makes a little tube for itself. And another species of gamma pod, this Ampelisca species. And then finally, the preferred prey item of the weak fish, the mycin shrimp. So more recently, in the previous, the last stock assessment, the 2016 stock assessment, managers noted that recruitment is at historically low levels. And so, of course, we need recruitment to increase if we want to see this fishery to come back. I don't think like, so we have recruitment and we have natural mortality that we're dealing with here. So considering that, we know that diet is linked to growth, which is linked to recruitment success. 
So because recruitment success is a factor of diet, or a function of diet, you know, it's prudent to understand the diet of juvenile bee fish in their primary nursery habitats. It's been 10 years, at least, since the last study has been done on juvenile bee fish diet in Delaware Bay. And so we need to really understand the current diet to, because it's been such a long time. And then I just want to point out that all these previous studies, and there were quite a few of them, they all focus either on one side of the Delaware Bay, either on the Delaware side or the New Jersey side. Never on both sides of the bay at the same time, simultaneously, and throughout the, the estuarine salinity gradient, you know, from north to south, and during the course of their whole estuarine residency from uh, around July through October. So this gives us some management priorities. The 2016 stock assessment, they had a really they put a high priority on looking at one aspect of life history, biology, and habitat. This was to monitor the weaker diets over broad regional and spatial scales, with an emphasis on new studies within estuaries. That's really exactly what I am doing. I'm trying to answer this question here. And then on the federal side of things, there's been a policy shift for a more ecosystem-based management approach, or ecosystem-based fisheries management, EBFN. And this is instead of managing one fish stock or one species of fish, there's been a push to understand how multiple fish species interact with each other, and those populations interact with each other in terms of their in terms of the climate, their predators, and their habitat. And so I'm kind of focusing my research on that habitat aspect of EBFM. All right, so I had two research questions. First one was, what are the drivers of carbon and nitrogen stabilized isotopes in these juvenile weak fish for different size classes between the states, Delaware and New Jersey, the season, summer and fall, the bay location, lower, middle, and upper, and that's it for those for that first question. Now, my second question was, what is the diet of these juvenile weak fish over time and space in the Delaware Bay <laughs> using both stomach content analysis and stabilized isotope mixing models? So what do we already know and you know, what can we compare my findings to? In 2001, Dave Emerson found that weak fish exhibit an ontogenetic shift in diet. Small weed fish, considered uh, to be 0 to 60 millimeter standard length, are mostly mice and specialists. Medium weed fish, 61 to 100 millimeter standard length, are known to begin to increase their consumption of forage fish. And then large weed fish, 101 to 137 millimeter standard length, should be eating roughly equal proportions of fish and invertebrates. Um, and I stopped there at 137 because that is the average length at maturity. So I was just looking at juveniles. In 1996, Greg and Target found that an increase in mites in the diet and the stomach is linked to a better body condition. And then in 1997, Langford and Target found that mice actually provide more energy than sand strip do per, per unit. Uh, weight, basically telling me that mice and shrimp are extremely important for the juvenile weak fish growth and thus recruitment success. <laughs> All right, so just a disclaimer, my method section is a bit dense and you know I'm just going to do the best I can to keep you guys awake here. I did a lot so I want to like do some justice. All right, so I ended up using a systematic stratified sampling design or SSS design. This gave me I separated the bay in half for the Delaware, New Jersey, and along the salinity gradient, the lower, middle, and upper bay. This gave me six total strata, Delaware upper, middle, and lower, and New Jersey upper, middle, and lower. I just want to point out that the New Jersey upper stratum only had one station in it, and so this stratum was data limited. The bay locations were chosen due to the expected changes along the salinity gradient in terms of the dominant marsh magnifier, the marsh grass, um, with Phragmites, which is an invasive C3 photosynthetic plant, it's much more dominant in the upper and upper middle bay areas, whereas uh, Spartina, or is the native C4 photosynthetic plant, is much more dominating in the lower bay area, associated with more polyhaving water, saltier water. Phragmites is a 
associated with uh, water about 10 per part per thousand of solidity. And this gradient of Spartina to Phragmites from the lower to upper bay has some stable isotope implications, like I'll explain, I'll explain a few slides on why that's important. Now for fishes, I use more of a modified systematic stratified sampling design because my original intent was to collect weed fish from the southern, central, and northern stations for each bay location to get a good representation along the salinity gradient. But because fishing isn't always perfect, I wasn't able to get weed fish from those specific uh, locations every, every month. And so I just had to take what I can get from whatever station that the fish were provided for me and did the best that I could to get a good representation along that solidity gradient. All the weed fish in Bay Anchovy were caught from the 2017 and 2018 juvenile finfish trawl surveys conducted by the Delaware Division and New Jersey Divisions of Fish and Wildlife. And those numbers here with the dots, those are all the sampling stations that where the weed fish came from. All the fish that you'll see here in this, in this talk today were caught from July through October, and I grouped the months into pairs uh, to simplify my statistical design. July, August, I called summer, and September, October, I called the fall. The weed fish were separated by size class that represents that ongenetic shift in diet that I mentioned previously. Small weak fish, my specialists, medium weak fish begin to incorporate more forage fish in their diet, and those large weak fish should be eating roughly half and half fish and vertebrates. So because of the proposed use of the stable isotope mixing models, I had to go out in the field and collect my own prey items to run for stable isotope analysis. And I did this in a SSS design to true form. I did sample from the southern, central, and northern stations per stratum from May to September using a benthic sled here for my shrimp collection, plate to toe for whatever else I could find that was originally intended to uh, be used for my shrimp, but the benthic sled was the best thing for that. And a van bean grab, which is a sediment grab. I use it to collect polychaete worms in the sediment because I knew that we fish were eating um, the, the items that I was trying to collect. So getting to stomach constant analysis. Uh, what I want you to get First is that stomach constant analysis is inherently limited to the diet, the representation of the diet on the order of hours. So just keep that in mind. I use a simple yet effective method of, of uh, stomach constant analysis, still being debated by fisheries biologists on whether it's not whether or not it's a, a good measure of dietary importance. But nonetheless, this is uh, uh, it's called percent frequency of occurrence, so percent F. And it's calculated as the frequency of prey item I is equal to the number of stomachs containing that item divided by the total number of stomachs analyzed multiplied by 100 to give you that percent frequency. So really it's just a percentage of a certain prey type within a certain group of fish. It's very simple. My goal is to collect at least 15 weak fish per bay location for each size, class, state, and month. Excuse me. So some constant analysis is Super simple, you gotta love how easy it is. At least the way I did. So, that gives me a stable isotope analysis. Now, stable isotope analysis is not so simple. It can be used in a variety of different ways, and I did use it in many different ways. So I'm gonna do the best to explain it to you from, uh, from the most basic level and give you a, you know, a, good, a decent lesson here. So, isotopes are different forms of the same element. They differ in the number of neutrons that occur in the nucleus. Because mass is neither created nor destroyed, they exist in the biosphere in known ratios in what is called the heavy and light isotopes. So if you direct your attention to the table, the elements that I have in red, those are the isotopes that I ended up using in the study. And we have here the isotope with the low mass, or the light isotope, makes up 99% more or less of that element in the biosphere. Whereas the isotope of high mass, the heavy isotope, makes up 1%, give or take, in the biosphere. So that the heavy isotope is rare. And so we could use that property to use them as tracers or dyes in ecosystem studies to really study that cycling of organic matter within an ecosystem or a food web. And so this is really what ecologists are interested in. We want to know what's going on, uh, where these ecosystems and food webs are getting their sources of organic matter. What's driving the production of this ecosystem and food web? 
Now, I'd be remiss, and Stacy would not be happy if I didn't talk about how these were calculated. They're calculated the delta notation, which is that squiggly line there, and this is like a measure of difference. So the delta value of the heavy isotope, HX, is equal to the ratio of the heavy to light isotope of a, of a sample divided by the ratio of the heavy to light isotope of a standard, subtracted by one, multiplied by 1,000, to give you parts per thousand or per mil units. And this is done to magnify those really minute differences between the sample and the standard. So it's like a ratio of ratios. So we use stable isotope analysis in many different ways in ecology, especially using delta N15 as a measure of trophic level in food web studies and, and diet studies. So we use delta N15 as a measure of trophic level because it increases up the food chain in a predictable rate. So from one food, from one trophic level to the next, from a primary producer to a primary consumer, it increases in a predictable rate. And this, and this happens in organisms, but this happens because organisms excrete the lighter isotope of nitrogen. So as that light isotope gets excreted out to the world, they keep that heavy isotope in their tissue. And so this is what is called stepwise enrichment or trophic enrichment. And I have here TEF, which is the trophic enrichment factor. This is the difference in delta N15 value between one trophic level and the next. And so for example, I have the mice strip here and the wheat fish here. If, we, if mice strip were at 10 per mil, wheat fish would be around 13 to 14. I forgot to mention that the TEF is typically uh, for delta 15 is around 3 to 4 per mil. Similarly, delta C13 also has a TEF, but it's not a measure of trophic level. And so the delta C13 value, the, the TEF, is only about 1 or less than 1 per mil. And it's really used as a measure of carbon source. Where is this organism getting its original source of carbon from? Where's the base of this carbon source? And I just want to mention that this is usually a negative value, not because there's negative isotope or there's no isotope in it. It's just because there's less heavy isotope in the sample than there is in that standard. So isotope analysis is really useful in aquatic systems. Not only is it used as a measure of trophic level, but it's also used as a measure of habitat type. I can use delta C13 to tell me if an organism is feeding on a more pelagic-based food web, based off more depleted or, or more negative delta C13 values. I can also tell if it came from a more benthic-based food web, based off more enriched or less negative delta C13 values. And like I mentioned before, the Spartina to Phragmites gradient in the Delaware Bay and other Mid-Atlantic estuaries that have Phragmites in it we can tell if an organism came from a more Phragmites dominated system based off more depleted delta C13 values that are on the order of negative 26 because Phragmites is a C3 plant, has much more depleted delta C13 values. And then on the flip side of that, Spartina, being a C4 plant, has much more enriched delta C13 values. And so we can tell that an organism came from a more Spartina dominated system associated with that saltier water. And then finally, Stabilized soap analysis is really useful in diet studies. First, it can tell you the, the proportion of prey items contributing to the growth of an organism or the tissue compilation, assimilation of, of an organism. And that's done using stabilized soap mixing models, so I'll get into that in a minute. But more recently, it's being used in fish diet studies as a good representation of the diet over time. So whereas stomach content analysis is a representation on the diet on a matter of hours, very short-term diet representation. So, stable isotope analysis is a good representation of the diet over time. And so different tissues are different representations of a different time frame. And so muscle tissues are considered to be a representation of the diet over a period of months, whereas liver tissues, a more metabolically active tissue, is a representation of the diet in a matter of, over a matter of weeks. And that really is the general rule that a lot of people use in fish diet studies using stable isotope analysis. They really don't go much further than that. It's like muscle is months, liver is weeks. But that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted something more precise. I, I wanted to know what my isotope values actually meant in terms of time. And so that's what's called the, the turnover time. It's the rate that isotope values of a consumer, so the isotope values of the weak fish, um, got replaced with the isotope values of the diet. 
And so I was able to use this growth-based turnover model in, from the Fuhai Stream Tour 2010, and this is for use in field studies. And using some weak fish specific growth rates, I found in a laboratory study and a turnover constant. I was able to determine that, you know, with a considerable amount of error, that 99% turnover is the time that it takes for the tissue to be pretty much completely equilibrated to the diet. It takes around 70 days for muscle tissue for that to happen, and around 14 days for liver tissue. So essentially, what this means is that the, the stable isotope analysis results of the or the values of the muscle tissue in weak fish is really a representation of the diet starting two months ago or the previous season, whereas liver is a representation of the diet just a couple weeks ago. So how do I do all this stuff? Um, well, first of all, I went to the lab after I got all my fish and I weighed and measured them. I removed the dorsal muscle and the liver and those were rinsed out with milky water. And then they were dried in aluminum weigh boats that you see in those, those mortars there at 60 degrees C in an oven for 48 hours. And then I ground them to a powder with a mortar and pestle, packed them up in little tiny aluminum capsules, and then shipped them off in these, these trays that you see. Now this is a typical invertebrate catch uh, from the benthic sled and the plankton toe with the nailer base loaded with the trays. Um, this was the best part. So I ended up cutting a bunch of that matter in petri dishes, suspending it in water, taking out whatever I could find, then I identified all those little things to the lowest possible taxon. This is a big clump of mice and shrimp. And then I dried those up, I ground them up, and then I had to acidify them, and then after that I air dried them, and then I packed them up and shipped them away to the lab. And I just want to mention that acidification was done due to known biases of the carbonates and the exoskeletons of these uh, invertebrates, of these hard-bodied invertebrates. And so the acidification process dissolves those carbonates and it's not really known to affect the delta N15 value. All right, on my statistics, almost still with my methods. So for my first question, what are the drivers of CNN stable isotopes in weak fish over time and space? I used generalized linear models that were nested for each size class per year for 2017 and 2018. I used the corrected AIC for model comparison. So using those four models, I used this AIC to determine which model had the best fit to the data. And then I did this for each tissue type, muscle and liver, isotope, I had to do delta C13 and delta N15 at different times, and then for each size class. Still in constant analysis, again, really nice and simple. I just used clustered column charts and tables for each size class per year by each bay location, season, and state. And so this is how I'm going to uh, show you guys the results. And then finally, getting onto the stable isotope mixing model. I just wanted you guys to understand how this works in a nutshell. And so it really is used as a tool to predict the proportions of prey items contributing to the growth of an organism, in this case our wheat fish. The, the, the rule is that you are what you eat. And so if we know the isotope values of our prey items, and we know the isotope values of our consumer, our wheat fish, then the, the model can kind of give us a proportion or an estimate of what our, our weak fish is actually made up of. And so in this case, just for example, our weak fish here was made up of 70% gamma and antipod and 30% mysotrip. So that's how it works. Specifically, I use the mixing model of Mixire. This is like the new age mixing model in R, and it's a Bayesian framework mixing model and that allows you to incorporate prior information to give you really a more realistic output. And I use the priors from the stomach content analysis data to inform my model so I get a more realistic output. Now I did this for the 2018 weak fish for each size class and each tissue type except for small weak fish liver because it just didn't get enough of the liver. And I did this for a state, bay location, and season combination. So we're still waiting. <laughs> All right. All right, so. Let's just start with the generalized linear models really quick. Um, this is a 2017 medium weight fish liver, delta C13 values. And the, using the AIC, I found that model two had the best fit to the data. So this is uh, station, nested within location, nested within state. I added weight to the model, and then month, nested within season. So taking a look, this is the summary statistics. I really want you guys to focus on the coefficient and the estimate the coefficient is like the factor, one of those factors there. 
However, the intercept is like the grand mean. So the mean of all the data, all the mean and weakest liver delta C mean value. And then we have the estimate column, which is, or I should mention, the red values are negative and the black values are positive. So taking a look, our intercept or mean is around negative 17 per parts per thousand per mil. Upper Bay in Delaware had a negative estimate and Summer had a positive estimate. So let's take a look at what's going on there. Upper Bay in Delaware, negative estimate. We have Delaware here, lower middle and, up, and upper bay. And we see that upper bay is more negative than the lower middle bay. So that's, and that estimate is pretty spot on. And then we have the summer, different between season, difference between season uh, summer and season fall. We've seen those summer values are more enriched, so more positive than the fall values. I guess just in that model, you know, it's telling us it's the, the results are good. All right, let's move on to the large weak fish liver values in Delta C13. Again, model two had the best fit to the data. And this kind of tells me that weight, because weight, this is the only model that had weight in it. And so I think maybe weight is actually a, a, a good ex, explainer of these Delta C13 values. So looking at our intercept first, we have uh, negative 19.7. So that's about two and a half units more depleted than those medium weak fish livers. Maybe this suggests that they're feeding on a more pelagic based food web. So then we're looking at our factors here. We have New Jersey and weight, a positive estimate, both positive estimates. And then the middle bay, New Jersey, and the upper bay in Delaware, both having negative estimates. So let's take a look at what's going on there. New Jersey, positive estimate, and that's what we're seeing. More enriched up to C13 values in New Jersey versus Delaware. Could be that they are feeding on a more benthic based food web, or um, the base of the food web there might be more enriched in Delta C13. Looking at weight, slight positive estimate. We have weight on the x-axis here, delta C13 on the y. Put a best fit line and we see that with increasing weight, we see an increase in delta C13 values. And then looking at the last two negative estimates, starting with Middle Bay in New Jersey, negative estimate, Middle Bay in New Jersey between the lower and Middle Bay, more negative delta C13 values than the lower bay. And we see that same thing for the upper bay in Delaware more depleted delta C13 values than the lower middle bay and the upper bay delta. All right, I'll stop bothering you guys with that. The GLM stuff is, it's not my favorite. So, some of constant analysis really is. So, in total for 2017, 2018, I looked at 1,028 non-empty stocks. In 2017, I looked at 348, and in 2018, at 680, and so this is really like the bulk of my study this year. So what I found was that mycids, gamerids, and polychaete worms were consistently the most preferred prey items of juvenile weak fish throughout the size classes for pooled bay locations, seasons, and states. I also found that seasonal foraging relationships were observed, I found many seasonal foraging relationships, especially my favorite, what I call the seasonal mycid gamer relationship. And I'll show you what this is in a couple slides. So just to get you oriented here with the next few slides, we have Delaware on the left-hand side, New Jersey on the right, summer and fall on the left and right-hand side of each panel, and then the numbers in the parentheses represent the sample size. And I know some of these sample sizes are small, but I wasn't able to get as many weeks as I wanted to. So taking a look at mycid trip first in the blue, mycid trip here, lower in the summer in Delaware, and they increase significantly in the fall. In New Jersey, we're not really seeing that increase from summer to fall, we're really just seeing a, a pretty stable relationship there between summer and fall. And then now taking a look at those gamma amphipods, higher in the summer and lower in the fall, or actually zero in the fall. And then in New Jersey, higher in the summer, zero in the fall again. Looking at polychaete worms, again, higher in the summer in, in Delaware and lower in the fall, but in New Jersey, we're seeing that they actually are lower in the summer and they increase in the fall. So, you know, we're seeing this difference between the states already. All right, this is a bit crazy. I, I know this one is, is kind of gnarly, but um, I'll walk you through it. So first I want you guys to see the, uh, the mycid gamma relationship. And then I'm gonna talk about the difference between the lower and middle bay and the secondary prey items. So just to make sure you understand that this is the lower bay and this is the middle bay. 
So first, what I want you to see is the, the seasonal mice and gamer relationship. It's super consistent on both Bay locations and both states, and for more data that's not shown here. So what this is, is the mice and shrimp are always lower in the summer, and they always increase to the fall, and then the gamma and pods are always higher in the summer, and they always decrease in the fall. So we're getting this really nice inverse relationship between mycids and gammas. And this is like you know, my favorite finding, I think. And it's a pretty significant finding because it's super consistent. All right, so now let's take a look at the secondary prey items. Polychaete worms in the lower bay, only 10% frequency or less. Then I move into the middle bay, and we see those polychaete worm consumption actually increase, increase quite a bit. Um, especially in New Jersey, you're seeing a 60 to 70 percent frequency of occurrence in, in polychaete worms in New Jersey. So maybe New Jersey might be supporting more polychaete worms. Now taking a look at isopods, very low in, in the lower bay, and then they increase a bit in the middle bay. Again, suggesting that this middle bay is maybe supporting higher densities of invertebrates. And then finally, just looking at the UID fish or bay anchovy. They're really one of the same, all the fish that I saw in the stomachs that I called UID fish were probably bay anchovy, just from the shape of them. Um, so, all right, so in the lower bay, UID fish, you know, fairly low, less than 20%, and then that number increases in the middle bay. So I think what might be going on here is that because of the higher densities of invertebrates in the middle bay, or what's, what that seems like, maybe bay anchovy are just coming to those areas, and then weak fish are taking that opportunity to predate on more fish. And then finally, just the last some constant analysis slide, looking at, you know, getting a good size range here. This is a large weak fish from the lower bay. And we see here, very high frequency of occurrence in mice and shrimp in Delaware on both summer and, and fall. And that same relationship in New Jersey. We've got a pretty nice seasonal mice and gamer relationship here in Delaware. Pretty stable in New Jersey. And then looking at the UID fish in the bay anchovy, we're only seeing 25% or less of occurrence of these bay anchovy UID fish. And yes, we could argue about what that means in terms of bulk and how heavy these fish are, but I think what I, what I really want you guys to get out of this is that these large weak fish that should be eating roughly equal portions of fish and invertebrates are really reliant on these small invertebrates such as mice and shrimp and gamma and amphipods. It doesn't matter how heavy they are, but they're in every, pretty much every single stomach of these weak fish. All right, so now let's take a look at the mixing model results. And I just want to get you guys um, oriented here. So on top of each graph, I have the state, bay location, and season combination. And then below, I have the sources that I use in the model. And these, I got stabilized to values for each of these sources. And the stomach constant analysis results here in the percent frequency, and those are the numbers that I used in my priors. And they were rescaled so that they weren't over informative. And then this is the mixing model results. Those values represent median diet proportions. So what that means is the median diet, so if we have 54% mice and shrimp, and we follow the peak of that distribution, that goes all the way down and gives a 54%. And so, yes, these are wide distributions, so it suggests that there, this is a fairly uncertain model. Um, and, you know, I acknowledge that. Mixing models are, there's a lot of error and different things that you can do, but I won't get into that right now. So what I want you to see is that this group of weak fish here was made up of 54% mice and shrimp. And these are small weak fish, so okay, mice and shrimp are important to the small weak fish. 15% gamma and amphipods. 21% polychaete worms, and then isopods less than 5%. So these guys are pretty negligible in the diets, suggesting these isopods are not really incorporating themselves into the tissues of weak fish. So now we have uh, across the bay the New Jersey small weak fish, same bay location, same season. You see these distributions got a little bit narrower, so this is a more certain model. Um, and I should mention, I forgot to mention, these are 95% credible intervals. Um, and so just looking at what we got here, we have mycids making up 30% of the diet here of the tissue. Gamma rays making up a good size 57% of the tissue of these small weak fish, suggesting that these gamma amphipods are contributing to the growth of weak fish. And then polychaete worms, 
and then isopods again less than five percent. So isopods are not very nutritious. Okay, this is large weight fish, and I'm going to show you the difference between the muscle tissue that slow turnover muscle and the quick turnover liver. And I think this is kind of neat. So we have here 44% mycids, 43% gamma rids, <clears throat> and the, the rest less than 5% median diet proportions. So what I think is going on here is that bay anchovy and crangon really not contributing to the muscle tissue or the, the growth of these large wheat fish. And we can think about this as being what they were eating in the spring. But then if we're looking at the liver tissue, sort of something two weeks before, we see that mycids are still making up a good amount, 37% of these weak fish, whereas gamma and amphiplos are making up 55% of, of their median diet proportions. So gamma and amphiplos and mycid shrimp, again, showing that even in the summertime, these large weak fish are really not reliant on these bigger uh, prey items, such as crank on the bay anchovy. So it's pretty interesting. We expect them to be eating more, more crayfishes, but really, that's not what the mixing models are telling us. All right. So what can I infer from all this stuff, and what does this all mean? So for my first question, the what are the drivers of carbon and nitrogen stabilized toes in juvenile wingfish over time and space? I found that there are several drivers of isotope values in wingfish. We found differences between season. Um, we know that stable isotope dynamics shift the basal food web due to primary productivity, and it's also there's temperature effects as well. And so that's kind of um, expected. We did expect to see some differences between the different seasons because in the base of the food web, we're seeing um, changes to the base of the food web that get reverberated into the, the rest of the food web. We saw differences between bay location. And I think what we're, what's going on there is, like as I mentioned, that dominant marsh macrophyte or the local source of organic matter is being reflected in the tissues of these juvenile weak fish. And this has been found before in previous studies. And I think that's what we're seeing is upper bay has more depleted up the C13 values really associated with that local source or that dominant marsh macrophyte, suggesting that the local source of organic matter is driving the production of, of these small juvenile fish, and probably other fish as well. And then finally, or sorry, we've got a couple more here. Um, state saw those differences between Delaware and New Jersey. And like I said, I think that New Jersey might be feeding on a more benthic based food web. And that could correlate to that increase in, in polychaete worm consumption. Those polychaete worms are living in the benthos, and that might be a reflective of that. Or, like I mentioned before, it could just be that the Delta C13 base in New Jersey is different than, than in Delaware. And then finally, we did see that weight um, estimate being being significant. And so what this tells me is that weight might be contributing to the delta C13 values. Um, you can use weight as an indicator of those values. And then my last question, what is the diet of juvenile weak fish over time and space using stomach content analysis and stabilized soap mixing models? So what did I find? I found that, yeah, mycins are important, and they continue to be important prey items for juvenile weak fish. But what I really think is neat is that so are gamerins. I don't think that this can be stressed enough. I think that gamer and amphipods are really important to the diet of juvenile weak fish. And I, you know, this is a picture of one of the stomachs I looked at, and it's just like a little one and a half inch stomach. And I saw several stomachs just like this, where it was completely loaded with these small amphipodesca species. So I think what's going on is these guys in the summertime they might be blooming in these huge densities, and if a weak fish is there, they're just going to open their mouths and just engorge themselves. I saw that the diet varies over time and space, you know, both seasonally. We saw this seasonal mycogamid relationship. I also saw, you know, polychaete worms were shown pretty consistently to, to be higher in the summer and lower in the fall. And I also saw. Um, the relationship between the summer and fall and Krangon. Krangon was also pretty consistent for being lower in the summer and higher in the fall, kind of like mycetrin. Um, and so my hypothesis is that we know that mycetrins do increase in natural mortality in the summer. And so 
because other marine transients and other resident fishes are predating on them. We have a lot of interspecies competition. And so as these guys are not as available, also they increase natural mortality because of, of higher water temperatures. So they're just not as available for these juvenile weak fish to eat, even though they are their preferred prey item. And so gamma and pods are kind of filling in that gap and, mice, and, and the weak fish are taking advantage of that. I think that's what we see in that mice and gamma relationship. Saw differences between the states. Like I mentioned, poly keywords were almost always higher in New Jersey than on the Delaware side. I don't know why exactly this is, but it could mean that poly that the benthic habitat in New Jersey might just be a, a better quality habitat for poly worms. So, you know, supporting higher abundances on that side. And then we saw that difference between the lower middle bay and the secondary prey consumption. The middle bay tended to have higher frequencies of those same prey items that were lower in frequency in lower bay, suggesting that maybe these medium salinities, these moderate salinity ranges might just be a better, suitable, more suitable habitat for invertebrates. And finally, looking at the bay anchovy, or sorry, looking at the size classes, we did see an ontogenetic shift in diet, but it wasn't like the previous ontogenetic shift, like I mentioned, that Nemerson found. Um, I think that they are feeding on more prey items or more prey fishes as they get older, but they're still continuing to be reliant on those smaller invertebrates. And I think that has some implications because weak fish are protracted spawners, and so they spawn from May to July. And so those late hatching juveniles might be competing, there might be some intraspecies competition with those larger juveniles on the same small invertebrates. You know, so that could give them a, a worse chance of surviving um, and some recruitment, those later spawn juveniles. And you know, it could be possibly increasing that natural mortality. So what does this mean for reef fish managers? You know, uh, this is fisheries, so we want to know what this means in terms of management. So on the regional side, I think that this might suggest that there might have been a shift in the invertebrate community. I don't know of other previous studies that looked at invertebrates, but this could, the, the mycegamer relationship could be indicative of that. Um, and I think it's pretty interesting that a lot of those previous studies never really emphasized the importance of gamma and amphipods. Um, and I think that's not saying something. So I think we need to investigate more into the energy density between these gamma and amphipods and mycid shrimp, because if mycid shrimp being the preferred prey item are just not, uh, sorry, gamma and amphipods are less energy dense. They could, could be contributing to increased natural mortality in the summer due to high, you know, we have this heat stress. And if gamma and amphipods are just not as, as energy dense, then it could be contributing poorly to the, to the juvenile weak fish uh, survival. And, you know, I think this calls for a more, uh, a bit, you know, more widespread investigation into the Delaware Bay invertebrate communities, um, both seasonally and along salinity gradient. And you know, these small invertebrates are really important to juvenile fish, not just weak fish, but other fishes that are economically important. And what that tells me is that the needs of to support a diverse invertebrate community are just as important as EFH or essential fish habitat. So we I think managers should consider the needs of invertebrate communities just as much as they consider uh, fish. And I know that that's kind of intertwined, but I'm just trying to emphasize that invertebrates are really important too. And then on the federal side, finally, last slide problem. Uh, in terms of habitat, I think that um, my GLM results showed the difference between stations, bay locations, seasons, and states. I know I have stations up here. I didn't show that in, my, in this talk, but there were differences between the stations. And I think what this means is that nutrient cycling or organic matter cycling is really important in small spatial scales. We're seeing really, we're seeing differences within these small areas, over these small areas. And so that tells me that local land use practices could be affecting their adjacent nursery habitats. We have a lot of development projects being underway in the Delaware Bay watershed. And, you know, we really need to consider those changes and those land use practices in terms of what they mean to nursery habitats that are really close to the water. 
And any, any decision that an ecosystem-based management approach tries to make, um, I think they need to really consider that small scale, the small spatial scale before they make an ecosystem-wide management decision. And with that, I just want to thank everybody that helped me, um, all the Denrec guys, Mike Greco especially, who's super nice to bag up my fish and label them all for me. And it's Brian Neely, Craig Tomlin, Andrew Hassel, Connor Davis from New Jersey, Grant Blank and Dev Management and Matt's Grant was awesome helping me make boat modifications and whatnot. DeAndre Oliver, Ashley's Bibby, and all the graduate students and undergraduate students who helped me. And uh, Steve Lippman, who really got me excited about weak fish stabilizing toads in Delaware Bay. And, um, you know, I don't want to keep on talking, but of course, my committee, thank you guys for all the advice that you gave me. Um, and with that, I'll take a question. Thank you. <laughs> No, no. I just took the save last, the, the bulk save last took values from Fred. Do you think that uh, different anthropogenic sources of nitrogen could have affected some of the results? Yeah, yes, I do. Um, and that's what I, I've been thinking about that a lot. And like I said, the, the mixing model results are pretty prone to error. Um, and I wasn't able to collect prey items from all the, all the stations that I collected from because they just, I just didn't catch them. Um, and I think that I need to look at that, look into that more. But yeah, so I have some slides here. Let me, let me find it for you. Because in the upper bay, the delta and 15 values were a lot higher. They were more enriched than we saw in the lower middle bay. And those, are, those values are associated with, uh, with wastewater seepage. And if you see here, um, this is some delta N15 of the actual dissolved inorganic nitrogen, or the dissolved, or yeah, organic nitrogen. And these values are pretty high. So this is water from both Delaware and New Jersey. And we have here the upper bay, which is about 15. Um, and the delta N15 of wastewater is around 10 to 20 per mil. And so we are kind of seeing that wastewater uh, sig uh, signature in the fish and also in the water, but that does get translated into the fish. And that's just corroborating that these local sources, and I, I think now on both sides of the bay, the local waterways are contributing to that, to the fish production essentially. Do you? Brian, uh, I tell you what, man, that's a tremendous amount of work. <laughs> it's very impressive. Thanks. And uh, the management of uh, considerations and conclusion that you reached, I think we're about to spot on. I, I, I really thought you did a tremendous job. Um, so, you know, a lot of these cyanids have been shown to, uh, to have an association with some of the environmental phenomenon like AMO and and things like that. So, considering that, and uh, you know, potential global warming and things, and you know, I never really considered the impacts on, you know, it, maybe it's all driven by my camera. So, what do you think about that? I, I mean, can you tell me anything about the life history of like mice that may play in? Uh, I honestly don't know too much about the life history of mice shrimp. I know that they do eat rotifers and they eat other smaller uh, zooplankton, not just phytoplankton. Um, so there could be some dynamics going on with that. But that AMO that you talked about, um, you know, my population biology class, I actually looked at that. We did like some phase 
portraits between, I looked at the AMO and the leak fish catch numbers, and there wasn't really any correlation between AMO and the, and the catch numbers. And uh, what else? Um, the, the catch numbers in terms of landing? Landings, yes, okay. yes, uh, from the NOAA website. <clears throat> but I was also going to mention that I looked at the trends from the New Jersey temperature data that they gave me from all the juvenile trawl service from like 1992 uh, to 2017. And there really wasn't any, you know, trend. It was like pretty up and down. So mm -hmm. I don't know if the Delaware Bay isn't really getting warmer over time. Maybe it has been since you know, the past 50 years, but in the past 20 years, it really hasn't. So I don't think it has anything to do with warming. Um, and that was, I was actually gonna mention that in that slide, that maybe gamblers are associated with warming water it, because if they're so high in the summer, they like warm water. So that could be a driver, but I, I really don't think it is. Thanks. No, there actually weren't. There was a lot of, uh, they were mostly full. It was like maybe like five or 10% empty stomachs. Um, I was actually expecting more. Ryan, when you were monitoring water quality, remember you used the YSI to monitor. What do you think about water quality on Delaware side versus uh, New Jersey side, up or and down? Like this um, oxygen like primarily. I'm talking. I think it's really the same. Um, same. Yeah, I don't know about the, I didn't really look too much in the water quality, honestly. Um, but, I mean, if you're looking at the dissolved organic nitrogen here, I have New Jersey and Delaware. Um, so if you're just comparing the Middle Bay and New Jersey, dissolved organic nitrogen values are you know, around 11 and a half in the Middle Bay versus Delaware in the Middle Bay. And it's really the same, it's really the same value. So, I mean, I can't really tell you much about the water quality. I, I didn't take those measurements in New Jersey, and I didn't really go out that often in, uh, in the Delaware side too. It was like once a month. So you mentioned about the benthic. So you know, like one of the uh, um, discussion I you, you had was that the sediment might be more appropriate for you know in better conditions. So that's why I'm really right. And that yeah, I, I don't know what. That phenomenon is. Um, I yeah, thought it might have something to do with. Uh, I'm just speculating here, but it might have something to do with the increased aquaculture on the New Jersey side. And I, I know you guys have done work on with aquaculture, oyster culture has a benefit, a beneficial effect on the benthic community. I'm not, I'm not, I don't remember if it actually did have a, a beneficial effect, but that could be it because there's nothing on Delaware side right now. So. Who knows? You flip into one of your mixing model results the distribution of the fish. Real quick. I know we we're gonna have another opportunity to ask some questions, yeah. but this is what I wanted to ask in public. That was good. That, was, that one was one of the ones that we showed. Oh, that's. Good. I just wanted to see the shape of it. So you said that you know, spread there is you thought attributable to error. In the mixing model, okay, that's that's what I was going to, to say. So, what would be the components? There's error, and what else would be a component of uncertainty here? Okay, so the mixing model results kind of uh, you could use your own trophic discrimination factors, like mm -hmm. I mentioned, so that shift. Um, and I just use the standard 3.4 for delta into teen and one for carbon. Mm -hmm. you, you, you could also put a standard deviation like 0.2 or 0.4. Um, but not only that. <laughs> The assumptions say that there needs to be uh, each prey source, each source needs to be different. Mm -hmm. And really, for, for my results, that didn't wasn't always the case. So we have here mycids and polychaetes are pretty similar, and gamma and amphipods and isopods. These guys are actually more farther apart than mycids and polychaetes, and so I think that's also part of that uncertainty is because these guys are pretty close together. So ideally, in an ideal situation, these guys would be all in four corners yeah. and the weak fish would be somewhere in the middle. Okay, 
Yeah. No, that, that I was also thinking maybe there's just a lot of variability in the diet too, right? It's yeah. Just and a lot of natural variability. So. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Thanks. Come on. I <laughs> <laughs> ask a general kind of question because it's possible a lot of people don't quite understand the Bayesian analysis. Could you describe how you combine your priors and your posterior distributions? Yeah, well, the posterior distributions were done from the priors. Um, so that was the model I just, you know, press enter. Um, but let me see here. I do have a slide for you based off the posterior distribution, the prior. So um, the priors have to be rescaled. So this is a good, a good, um, right here. This is an informative, so this is an uninformative prior. So if you don't include priors, this is what we use one, one, and one. So if you have three sources, you just put one, one, one. It's just an even or uninformative prior. And then this is if you use the true numbers from the stomach content analysis data. And so you get this really, it's, they call it over informative. It's just, it's, you know, it's too perfect. So what we have to do is you kind of use this uh, equation and you end up with a rescaled prior from this num from these numbers. Um, and so that gives you the same mean as one, one, and one, but a different distribution. And so that's, that's the, uh, that's the equation right there. And so I don't, I don't know if you want me to explain more about that. No, I think that's, that's weird. Okay. Although explain what over informative means that it's, there's. Yeah, so I, I think what it, my understanding is that over informative is like, so I, if I used the true numbers uh -huh. of the frequency data, so if I use 60%, 70%, and 30 percent for each source that prior information is like is, is too specific or it's um, it's a uh, it's gonna it's gonna change the posterior distribution like in a way that is not really realistic i think that's what it's supposed to be is there a difference between over informative and over dispersed uh I don't, I don't know um, I think over informative means that it's a really narrow distribution versus over dispersive. That's like the opposite of over informative. I'm thinking you use your thesis, that term, number of cases? Dispersed? Uh -huh. Over dispersed, yeah. Uh -huh. That's why it was, yeah. It's a lot oh, of so over was, was in the GLS. Over dispersed right? was in the GLS, yeah. not yeah. in the yeah. yeah. invasion. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is amazing stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. We can keep talking about it, don't worry. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any more questions? If we don't have any more questions, um, thank you, Brian. Thank you.